Welcome back to Switch Corner. Today we're taking a look at Ancestors Legacy on the Nintendo Switch. This one, it's a real-time strategy game and that is so often a recipe for disaster on a console. Can this one though be one of the few to get it right and deliver? Well hit subscribe if you love the Switch as much as we will do here, join our growing family and let's get started. The story on this one is influenced by a historical offence in the Middle Ages. How accurate? No idea, but I enjoyed the stories we do get. Essentially, the story it goes like this, choose from one of four available nations. You've got the Vikings, known as the Kingdoms of the North, the Anglo-Saxons, known as the Kingdoms of Britannia, the Germans, known as the Holy Roman Empire, and finally Slavs, known as the Kingdom of Poland. Within each, then you're going to find two leaders who will lead your squad to war, and each of them gets their own five chapters. Well, none of them, I will say, provide the deepest of storylines, and nor would it be a reason to actually pick up the game. They are largely entertaining as you follow these warriors through these like key moments of war and strategy. Expect everything from the simple, like, you know, needing camps for an advantage to taking down entire kingdoms. They capture a good sense of scale between, you know, the small wins and then some seriously impressive big ones. My favourite thing, though, every single mission, though it might start you know, simple enough with like one objective, it would quickly evolve into multiple as characters delivered more key information to me. It felt real in that sense that yes, there was an objective, but in war things can change quickly and I very much needed to adapt. With the ability here then to jump freely between these nations after completing the opening like four tutorial missions, you'll be a Viking in those. It adds up though, I will say to some like great variety and freedom in regards to where you go next and very much leaving that in your hands. With 40 missions too, but RTS fans, I gotta say, this one's an easy like 25 to 30 hour experience, and there's for sure reasons to head back into it. Good work on the story front, not the deepest, but I enjoyed the variety thanks to the way the game very much focused on just like individual key moments. So gameplay then and where do I even begin? Here's the controls first of all on screen. This is what they call the basic controls. Yeah, it's a lot going on for basic, but can I just point out how stunning these custom designed Joy-Cons are on this screen and they need to release them. Got distracted, but anyway, but then that's just the beginning. Here's the action list. A lot there, right? But look, I'm gonna say it now, Ancestors Legacy has taken the complicated and no matter how intimidating this list may seem, does a great job of not only simplifying what could be terrifying, but it teaches them at a pace where you will for sure retain the information. At the beginning of the game, I was for sure clumsy, but after the tutorial, I felt confident and comfortable. The main core experience basically comes down to moving and positioning units, collecting resources, occupying enemy locations, defending your own locations, some minor construction and then of course combat. This game it feels like it was always destined for a console because I will say it holds your hand a lot, like let's say structure placement, it's pretty much automatic in its location for the most part, so you still feel smart but it removes some of the clunkiness it could have brought along with it. Now I could talk about controls here for hours with a game like this, and I won't be doing that, but consider this more high level, but I've got to say, look, a few smart design decisions here make it very much accessible. Quick selection for you in it so you can quickly, you know, move as a whole squad. Hotkeys then attached to the left and right trigger for those more frequent actions like I regret to say it, but like retreat when you make a terrible decision. And then there's like an action camera as well, which is pretty cool. It gives you like this cinematic viewpoint of the action. And we'll talk about that more in graphics. Combat though as a whole, it's a lot of fun, whether it's simply charging into battle, stealthing yourself around ready to flank, or taking advantage of terrain to get the, you know, that high viewpoint. It always felt rewarding. Problems, the two big ones for me. Selecting every unit was simple, but when they all got bunched together, it could be a little difficult to work out who I had selected. I kept stupidly, for example, sending my archers into hand-to-hand -hand combat and getting them slaughtered in seconds, so trying to fix that mistake was a little awkward at times. Then moving across the map, so let's say you want to go to your base and train up a new unit, you're going to have to drag that camera the whole way across. I'm going to give it to them, there's no way around it on console, but it's still pretty cumbersome. So 
stuff. So outside of the core combat then it shouldn't surprise you if you're a fan of the RTS genre. Expect some like minor base building so you know fortifying your position, unit recruiting and then resource collection that's attached to locations on the map. This works like this, you take over an enemy occupied village by let's say burning down all the buildings and then you actually recruit locals to go collect resources on your behalf. It's basic but that's actually why it works so well on a console and I'd say these moments of gameplay I'd see them more as like a side dish to the heavy combat focus. I do quickly as well want to touch though on the user interface because there's a whole lot going on here but honestly I gotta say it all makes sense again you'll be showing it through the tutorial to a very high degree generally I've got to say it's not bad at all and it's basically paying attention to what are quick actions the only pain point for me the occasionally like obnoxiously big tutorial or text box that comes from the left hand of the screen and just blocks everything overall for gameplay look there's a ton of content here the combat feels good and for the most part the controls are solid thanks to some smart design I do want to say here as well they've tried to implement touch controls for handheld and respect for doing so but I wouldn't consider them a good way to play personally and if anything they're probably going to slow you down. Fair play for trying but there's just way too much here to navigate and I would probably have fired them honestly. Everything else around combat then though like resource gathering, basic building, less simplistic but that's why this is transitioning so well to consoles. It's just enough to feel involved without ever feeling convoluted. With a nice variety of missions though that accompany the plot points really well I gotta say I was impressed with gameplay and it's a smooth transition but there's one big problem and I want to close on this. The Xbox, the PC, the PS4 versions all have online play and I will say it's an omission here. This is very much a single player on switch experience only so if that's a big issue to you then unfortunately this is not the place to play all right so graphics and if you've watched this far you can see for yourself we have some good and then some clear sacrifices made to get this thing onto the switch and i can't say honestly i'm surprised not only is it demanding for sure but we get a lot of content here we've got 30 maps which are all unique and i gotta say at times huge then the amount of units you can be controlling at points there's a whole lot of action on screen and they've squeezed every bit of performance they can out of the switch good points as well when it looks good it really looks good like this castle sweeping shot here that i was really impressed i also want to shout out the cutscenes, these animated moments they take place during loading screens, so they can be a bit stuttery at points. But I love the art style and I actually don't mind the stuttering because it's a distraction from obviously waiting for the game to start. Problems though, and the big one you'll notice first off is our unit animation. If you pull that camera the whole way out, which is actually the default, you can see there's a whole lot of frames skipped in their animation and to be honest, most often none at all. They look like they're ice skating around like some weird diorama. Zoom in just enough though and you can actually fix this to a certain extent, but you'll still notice it. It's maybe like three or four frames at this point making up leg movement. Same thing on animation can be said to a certain degree as well for combat, but I will say here at least kudos for some great and honestly brutal kill animations in Victory. Really did enjoy these, especially when I kicked into that cinematic camera. On the note of the cinematic camera actually, I will say I like it, but I will warn you, it quickly highlights the low detail units we're working with and occasionally it can go a little bit crazy whether it's clipping into the environment or just kind of flying all over the place. Then occasionally as well glitching as enemies die they seem to like fall in this weird like slow motion way albeit with some really nice animations of them dying but occasionally they would also like fly across my screen especially when like the bridges were involved weirdly. My biggest problem though, and this is the one that impacted gameplay because the rest never really did, but distinguishing which unit I was controlling. It took me a long time to work out visually which unit was which, especially as they kind of like clumped together and I had to rely on the squad icons in the top left corner that do highlight when you select them, but it still felt a little challenging to understand, honestly. Handout then, we need to address it, and personally it works, but it wouldn't be my go-to. It's not a text issue as such, it's definitely okay to read. There's just a lot going on here, and and for me I couldn't quite handle it with so many units and everything else that's going on it just felt a little too overwhelming especially for the nighttime levels does it work though for sure and in fact it's one of those scenarios where the smaller screen helps with the pixelation and all that but you just got to go in if you're going to handheld this is pretty demanding on like the navigation and user interface front and the small screen doesn't help there especially with like switching units identifying you know who is where there's a lot going on these characters can be very very small 
Overall, look, visually, we've made some compromises, that's for sure. Clearly, though, I think that was the intention. Deliver on the core experience, focus on the gameplay, and just keep it as smooth as possible. Having spent a lot of time recently with XCOM 2, I've got to say the frame rate here feels a whole lot smoother. It's fair to say, I think, that it's paid off on the performance front. Now, though, the question for you is, can you handle these pretty sizable compromises? So audio finally then, and I'll keep this quick. Love the music, it works well to the setting. Provided that level of epic you would expect while very much matching, you know, the tonality of each moment. Vice acting and every piece of dialogue in this one has an actor attached, whether it's the face over cutscenes or moments actually taking place within the action. Not only that, but I gotta say the acting is decently strong here as well. Then in game we get some light movement sounds, so think like footsteps, there's cheers on victory in battle and of course then battle sounds. The cheers on victory I loved because they gave me the indication the battle was over and I could start to plan my next move, even if they are the identical sound every single time. Combat wise would have loved it to have had a little bit more weight to the swords, to the arrows, the fire, it's all a little bit weak honestly. Never really kind of felt like it matched the scale of the battle itself, but it's decent enough. Look for the most part, outside of this audio is really really good stuff. So the final verdict for the right audience, I'll say it now, this is really good stuff. Sure, the graphics are pretty heavily compromised, whether that's, you know, the pixelation, the low textured details, or especially that lack of animation at time. Where it lacks in those areas, though, it's making up for it in its core gameplay. A lengthy campaign and skirmish options, they will keep you busy for sure for hours. Especially when you factor in as well the multiple difficulty options you can go and revisit. With that being said, though, we're paying the same as PC, PS4 and Xbox here, and we do see the removal of online multiplayer that's kind of a big issue in my eyes. Look, if you're an RTS fan, it has it where it counts on the gameplay front, but only if you can sacrifice on visuals and a lack of multiplayer. It kept me coming back because the core experience just had it where it counted. Today I'm giving Ancestors Legacy a good 7 out of 10, I'm being generous. I was definitely arguing with myself with this one with the lack of online, but you know what, I had a great time with it overall and that's where it counts. If online is what you need though, look for a version elsewhere and if graphics are a huge deal to you as well, I'd say knock this one down to a 6. 30 hours of gameplay though, it's still a decent chunk of gameplay and we don't exactly have a ton of you know, real-time strategy titles available to us on the Switch. So yeah, I like this one a lot and if you're a regular, you know how tough I can be in my reviews typically. Thanks for watching today, I truly do appreciate it. If you're new here, consider hitting that subscribe button, join our growing family and I'll see you all on the next video. Thanks everyone.